Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. So today's such a big deal for me because today is um, my first real live stream and uh, it's not going uh, according to plan as you can see. Um, ordinarily, I would stop and edit this out and um, I'm sorry, I can't do that now. It just, it just takes so long to edit. So I'm just gonna go, um, it's, I mean, it's already off the dome, but um, I'm just gonna have to accept that it, if it's not exactly the way I want it to be, it's just, I'm just gonna have to leave it. And um, I already tried to make one uh, just a moment ago and I kind of like choked, you know, um, I kind of was in the middle of saying something, I'm just like, ah. cause I was reading my notes and I, I got kind of confused and I'm like, oh crap. So I, I'm restarting the, the stream. Um, but yeah, I want to get straight into it. So Miles Gore and who is he? Why should you care about who this man is? Uh, most of you probably have no idea who this who this guy is. Um, okay, if, if there's no wind, I, there's no need for the for the towel. Um, <laughs> um, so most of you guys have have no idea who he is. Um, but he's he's a very interesting character. Um, that he's he's I would say. It's he's someone that's very important to look at to um, to look to right now um, because he's a very interesting figure and I think he he's the kind of character I could imagine he could be a, a historical figure one that you may uh, remember um, for good or bad who knows how this could turn out in the end but he's he's one of those larger than life characters that you, you know you don't really see so often you know he's a he's a very he's a very different kind of Ch Chinese man he's a he's a very uh, I guess you could say a flamboyant character. Um, and ultimately, if I could surmise his uh, his journey so far, at least the journey since he's become relevant, we'll say since 2016, he's a Chinese billionaire who is, I guess you could say, a developer. He founded something called the, the Pangu Plaza, which is kind of like a chain of malls that you might find throughout China. I guess probably not anymore. And he fled uh, to America uh, because of uh, persecutions by... Uh, the Chinese Communist Party. That's uh, according to him. Um, but I, I will, I will give the due, and I'll, I'm going to talk more about this, uh, this situation. So if the audio quality sometimes isn't, isn't as good, it's just, uh, yeah, it's very windy right now. Um, but yeah, he's currently embroiled in a, in a lot of drama, and he's found his way back into the news cycle um, in the West, of all places, uh, precisely because he's, um, you know, there's something about so he's supposedly defrauded thousands of people out of a billion dollars and he's used all these things like wire fraud and all these uh all these different scams to be able to um to be able to get money out of his uh gullible so that that's the narrative that's being told um and really just kind of suddenly out from from out from the woodworks because as i mentioned you know you may have not really heard about him um uh, but suddenly he's kind of like in in Western news media, not even not necessarily Chinese news media. You know, now of course he he lives in America um, because you know, because of all, uh, you know he's he's basically a, an asylum seeker there, um, which we'll get into. And uh, he's living in New York, and uh, the New York State District Attorney decided that you know uh, like oh he, this guy is actually a really bad dude, and so they come in after him. But there's a lot of controversy about it because it's not entirely clear whether this is a legitimate persecution or just a a political persecution. And we're going to go into that. So there's um, uh, there's a lot of controversy around this now because the he's, he's basically being um, in in many ways attacked uh, precisely because of his connection to Stephen Bannon, and Stephen Bannon for the most part is being attacked because of his connection to Donald Trump, right? So the the problem with with these kinds of situations is like. Are these all legitimate persecutions? Like, if you believe that, uh, um, you know, Donald Trump, Trump, um, I'm just going to call him um, Orange Man Bad. I don't even like saying his name. I'm just going to call him o o -M OMB. So whenever you freak out and you go you chuck a little tantrum, you, instead of saying OMG, you can say OMB, Orange Man Bad instead, right? So um, if, you, if you believe that, the, um, that OMB deserves to be arrested um, for having sex with a hooker 20 years ago and he paid her hush money to not blab about it. You know, if you believe that, he, you know, a former president deserves to be arrested for that, then you're also probably okay with you know, the things that Steve, you know, Bannon is supposedly being accused of, which is um, something of, of a similar nature. And then you've got Miles Kwok, who is also being, having, having a similar thing, you know, um, 
and I've looked at the charges, I've looked at the situation, and it, I mean, it doesn't, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll just say this, like, I don't think it deserves the media, if, if this is a legit, um, it's, it, I'm not saying that, you know, if he actually did defraud all these people out of their money, I'm not saying it doesn't deserve news headlines, it's just that the way it's always being framed and portrayed is that I'm constantly forced to be reminded about OMB, and, you know, and Steve Bannon, you know, whenever there's a discussion about Miles Gore. So that really makes me very, very wondering, is this a legitimate thing? You know, because whenever I read about it, you don't get many specifics. And the more I actually look into the actual exact details of this case, the more I, I feel like this is this is in fact exactly that case. But I, I I need to go more into it because I also want to tell you about this character. He's a very interesting character. So um I want to start with some history. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it in a chronological fashion, so I don't jump from you know from different time periods because there's a lot. Of, I, I have to discuss this from the beginning. So I've given you the intro about him. Um, oh, and by the way, sorry, this is well, by the way, this is this should have been part of his introduction. Basically, um, while he's in America, since he he left China, he's been um, part, he's really built a very very strong attack against the Chinese Communist Party. Um, specifically, he has a very big whistleblower network within China. Um, and I think you should, it's very easy to believe again from the history that I'm about to tell you about. This guy does have very, a lot of very intimate connections with uh, Chinese Communist Party officials and very powerful people in China. And um, the kind of intel you can get out of this kind of person is much more valuable than not. And, uh, and at least even if you don't believe him or believe, you know, um, if you don't believe me, I mean, that's at least what the American intelligence agencies think. And that's exactly why they, they put him in. Because they don't just take on any Chinese billionaire. You have to really offer something of value to these guys, you know, because, well, for one, you're a national security threat. You can't just kind of let any person as an asylum seeker. For, for business, fine, but, you know, for as an, uh, pretty much as an asylum seeker, almost. Um, you, go, you, better, you better give the dirt, right? So he really does know a lot of... Um, a lot of people and you know so he's able to get a lot of dirt on these, on these people he knows where the money is hidden and he was able to tell a lot about the inner workings and sometimes uh, honestly some things he does say do, do turn out to not be true and so i i see it it's like just but just because i don't someone isn't right all the time doesn't mean i always i won't listen to them because sometimes they're right about some things sometimes they're wrong about others so that's why i do li like listen to him you know um anyway He's yeah. So he's been really fighting against the the, the Chinese Communist Party in a number of ways, and the, and the big one is that he's created something called the NFSC, which is the New Federal States of China. Which uh, you know, last video we were talking about the split between you know the Communist Party and the Kuomintang, and the Kuomintang, and the um, the 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 progressive progressive Democratic Party in Taiwan. So there's all these splits, you know, within China. This is a new split. And that's why I'm, I was saying there's a potential for this man to, you know, be somewhat historic. I'm not saying he's going to take over China one day. But, I mean, he's the founder of this new split. And this NFSC is, I guess, it's intended to be like a, um, a government in absentia in the, in the same way, um, say, that the Tibetan uh, government is in absentia or the pa Palestinian government is in absentia. My problem... Uh, with this first, first and foremost is that you know no one voted for it it was just kind of put in there and this is also in my opinion very much help set up by the intelligence agencies because from everything I watched about Miles Cock he is not I'm not going to say he's not a smart he's a very smart man but he, this is not if, if, I mean he, he does business he's a businessman but it's, it's starting his own country essentially <laughs> Um, you know, I don't really see that that's something that he's just done alone. You know, just the moment he became, went to the United States, he created his own government in absentia, you know, that he's protected by this, uh, you know, well, by, I guess, the CIA and people like that. Because you can't just, you know, do what he's done and, and put, all, put out all this dirt against the Chinese Congress. So he actually has really hurt them. I'll, maybe I can go about that in another video. Um, but yeah, you, they will kill you. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. America, if anything, is maybe easier to kill you. Don't they have like Chinese uh, um, police stations in there to get dis dissidents into America? And by the way, that's it's for this reason. It's because of people like Miles Gore. Um, they have those Chinese police stations, right? Um, anyway, so now that's the intro. Okay, now, now I'm done. I promise I'm done with the intro. So, but I got to talk about the history. And we're gonna link it back to this. So, how, first, how, how can you, you know? How does Miles Gore even know? you know, all these powerful people, you know, how, how, how does he know all this dirt about all these people? You know, why should we listen to it? So first, um, I want to tell you about 
back in the 70s, um, during the Mao times, um, it was generally party policy that all the economy and all the functionalities of normal life um, was uh, supported by, was supposed to be supported and run by uh, the state. Everything was supposed to be part of the planned economy. But obviously, as you know, things didn't work out. It was completely dysfunctional. And what happened was that the only thing that was left was the black market economy. And when we think about uh, Geiger, economic reform that happened in 1978, we think that Deng Xiaoping did something. Like Deng Xiaoping was this brilliant reformer, and maybe he was. I actually think he was a brilliant pro uh, politician. And, but at the end of the day, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything with, with the economy. All he did was officialize the black economy. And by officialize, basically it was decriminalized. It was just accepted. Put this over again. It was just accept accepted and it was no longer something you could get in trouble for. So these black markets were basically just all over China. And if you just wanted anything, if you wanted antibiotics, you go to the black market. If you want to read a book, you go to the black market. If you, I mean, it, I mean, for the most part, if you just wanted to go get some ham, if you wanted to get this food, you go to the black market, you know, because if you go to the, the normal, uh, I mean, if you wait for your rations, you know, you're probably not going to really get much. So the black market economy just became the real economy. And then when they just stopped persecuting, oh, well, all of a sudden the economy is boomed. It was booming in private because that's the only way people knew how to survive. So the time of the 80s is when you had the, the economic boom. Um, and But the, the place in which it outgrowth is almost like out of the compost bin. It was the black market economy. So what a, the black market co economy was just a, was very cowboy. It was, in fact, very, very laissez-faire, uh, maybe even to an extreme, you know, maybe even to an extreme that is not like it, it's so laissez-faire to the point that um, um, it, it was a little bit anarchistic in, in some sense. And um, this uh, plays into how basically you needed to know somebody you know if you to to i mean look you i'm not saying there weren't people that wor worked hard and just did, did it the ordinary way but it was a well-known fact that basically if you wanted something done you had to know someone in um in the communist party right so that was the primary reason why people joined in the 70s um it was just about you know kind of uh, getting ahead and also the fact is that if you're in business, if you're in private industry, you have to know someone uh, to, I mean, to, maybe to get to a next level, not on a small level. It's not like, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're just a butcher and, you know, you've got to know the local cadre, right? Typically it was, well, I mean, in the seventies, it was like that because you needed protection, right? But generally, uh, you know, in the eighties, it was like, if you were to become bigger and bigger, you're going to have to rub shoulders with some people. Cause like, you know, there's like this old building there that was built during the, during the, the time of Mao. And it's like this old abandoned factory that, that was, uh, like used for like like a commune right like um, what do we do with a commune well you know let's let's i want to build something i want to do like a real estate development there well how are you going to do it well it's you know the car you know you got to know someone in the, in the cadre just to be able to get certain things done so um generally speaking um you've got all these with it with the economic boom you've got these different companies and individuals kind of rising up economically in that society but part of their them rising up is that they they've got to have more and more friends right so guanxi is very very important guanxi means relationship and that's the i you know there's a very important aspect of that in business and also with people in, in the government so um you know the, there was all there was always this kind of marriage between you know private industry and the state on on, on just like a personal click level you know these these were very standard relationships um, you know, the private, the people in the private industry, you know, would, of course, help their friends uh, in the party, of course, but, we, you know, with, with paying them and stuff like that. Um, and, but at the same time, they get these, you know, certain rights. So generally, it's considered that if you're very wealthy in China, um, you have a lot of personal connections to the Communist Party. And the wealthier you are, um, the more you would really need things to, you'd really have to know certain people in order just to get things to move around. So, um that's the, the the kind of environment that uh Mao's war came up in you know so um this is how he i for sure he knows a lot of people and um he has a lot of personal connections um with people in the communist party and he has a lot of uh, profound insights about the things that they're up to um but for the they he, he was not really you know like some kind of bleeding heart liberal secretly the whole time you know in china i'm i'm sure I'm sure it was not the case just up until um, more recently in history, you know, because um, it 
this kind of arrangement um, was comfortable for a lot of people in China and a lot of people, especially in business, you know, didn't really mind the, the situation in China because generally the government kind of left them alone because they respected what these capitalists, I guess you could say, um, you know, we're, we're bringing to the table, you know, and it's kind of a weird thing to think if you purely think if you think about it purely in, you know, on a political level, um, it's hard to imagine that you've got like literally people in the Communist Party who actually just very recently in the history persecuted uh, these uh, these capitalists you know, within the country, the people who emerged out of the black market economy, and then these same, these same kind of individuals that emerged out of this black market stew, these capitalists, the capitalist rotors, as they called them back in the 60s and 70s, they're now best friends. You know, they, they, they are very completely synergistic with each other. That was mostly the case. I mean, uh, officially, it's still the case. Um, what is it? Socialism with Chinese characteristics. But um, this, there was... There, what was before this period again this kind of this synergistic marriage and what's currently now in what would you call the Xi Jinping era has has shifted quite a a lot and what has basically happened is that you went from a very laissez-faire kind of system and laissez-faire doesn't always mean good from a from a capitalistic sense like there's Again, like you, you, the fact that you need to know people just, you know, to be able to, you know, to get ahead is obviously not a very good thing. And it does lead to a lot of corruption. But at the same time, things were so kind of wild west and free that people could almost do anything they wanted in a, you know, in, in a sense. I mean, again, the black market start kind of style of thinking. You want to set up, a, set up a stall here? Sure, you want to, you can do that. If you have some opportunity to make money here, you can go do that. Um, no one's going to stop you, you know, but if you want to move ahead, maybe you do have to know people, but you can do that if you wanted to, you know. So it's kind of like standard, like the third world country, banana republic type, type stuff, you know. You can do whatever you want, but, you know, if you want to get further ahead, you, can, you go to Greece and Palms. Um, so that's what I mean, like, by lies of fair, ultimate lies of fair, more than, say, like, even in the West, right? But this started to change um, in the Xi Jinping uh, years. So Xi Jinping, as you know, is the most powerful chairman since, uh, uh, since Chairman Mao. And that's not uh, by accident. It had to be that way for him to, well, survive. Um, Chinese politics is not a monolith, and there's a lot of uh, factionalization within there, um, and there's a lot of different cliques within there. So, for instance, people have, generally speaking, loyalties to their, um, to the different, uh, to the different cadres within their province, right? And the person that someone might answer to, they might answer to, would be someone that you know they might even live on their street, you know, or might be within their, on the, it will be on their district or city level, right? So there's loyalties within cities, loyalties for province, pro- loyalties within the with even say different language groups, like if you speak Cantonese, um, and but generally, of course, everyone answers to Beijing. But at the end of the day, sometimes like you know, you might answer to someone on the street. That person might answer to someone in the city, and then that person in that city might have to answer to someone in Beijing. But that gap is enough where it's like certain tribes and cliques consolidate and have more interests with each other. And then of course, there's also certain overlapping business interests, and you know, so it's not just like everyone just follows one person, like in the army. It's not like the army at all, right? Um, you've got these different things, and as a result, there can be factionalization and. Um, uh, for instance, Jiang Zemin, uh, his clique with, in the Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Shanghai region, um, they uh, basically, when he lost, when he came out of power because of term limits, right, he was actually able to wield um, Hu Jintao like a puppet. And, you know, Hu Jintao didn't really have a lot of power. So he was almost kind of like, he was still so powerful, still so powerful to this day that he was, he was kind of like a, like a, uh, like a, a deep state or something like that, uh, like a, a, an inner party clique that's still pulling the, the strings behind the scenes, you know? Um, and because that's the thing with, with the Communist Party, sometimes they don't even really use, like, titles. Sometimes the titles of what they do are, are not always clear, and the, their functions can go outside of what their titles are, and, yeah, it's, 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 it can be a bit of a, a murky territory. So Xi Jinping, when he came to power, he was... Um, uh, he was an underdog at some stage politically, right? I mean, as you always start out, um, but, you know, he wasn't supposed to be the person that he is today. He wasn't supposed to be this, this all-powerful person. It's generally assumed that within that world, um, if things don't go well for you politically, you just, you just, you're gone, right? Um, you can be like Bo Xi Lai. There's many characters we don't, whose names we don't even know about, because you know, they were just, uh, their time was ripe long before we've even heard their names. 
Um, but Xi Jinping bucked that trend. But in order for him to really consolidate power for himself, he, he went on these anti-corruption campaigns that swept through the nation. And many people say it brought a lot of order, um, you know, because there was a lot of, I mean, yeah, I mean, again, Wild West times, black market economy. There's a lot of grift, a lot of corruption. And it can be a very, um, it can be far less functional when, you know, you got all these different people doing their own things. And, but of course, where the self-interest is with, with the Xi is that he gets to take out his competition. It gets to consolidate power, you know, especially from all these like local and provincial level people who you know, may have never heard of his name. And he's, he's making it clear, like, you know, uh, you answer to me now. I'm, I'm, I'm the big boss, you know, no more uh, kicking it up to your, your, your little boss that ends. And, you know, with that, a lot of those kinds of relationships kind of die off. You know, people like they, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, grift relationships, you know, maybe it's got like some person and and I won't go into it too much, but that that really that kind of cut off those those little networks that would have existed outside of Xi's own authority. So that's how they consolidate power. But then after him becoming commander of chief, that's him really just making it so um, no one could use any say kinetic means to take him out of power so there's the you know the, the little social click things you know he's got rid of that then no one could come after him you know using uh violent means which uh, can still happen you know so jung zemin you know he's he basically had the uh, the equivalent of like their kgb basically for a while and um she's basically worn that down to a nub as he's become more powerful but you know they could have always used it against him and they they use a lot of spy stuff you know i mean they, they'll they'll listen to your conversations they'll they'll try to smear you so it's not obvious that it's like always like um you know they'll come after you like come into your house with guns and nines a coup you know it's kind of like yeah it's very um um very cloak and dagger type stuff you know but that's 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 how they get you i mean any country right um and then lastly what she did was uh well you know supposedly they voted on it and that was to to get rid of the term limits so what i'm trying to describe is a situation in which you have a very laissez-faire system for good and bad um that kind of existed after mal i wouldn't say it was a vacuum but it was a you know it was a more freer kind of time and then after with she we've got a consolidation of power in different ways on you know in terms of uh, consolidating power from his rivals um uh political power and um and yeah and and yeah yeah and even just just shoring up his base so the point is this this ties in with an overall consolidation that happens on another level and that's the on the private level so we're talking about this harmonious beautiful marriage between the communists and the capitalists and love each other um and now we've <laughs> right and then we got um uh xi jinping who now kind of wants to subsume uh the other side of that relationship and he's starting to go after the the private sector but not not in a not in a way that was like, um, say, during the Mao era, where it was like we're going after the capitalists again. Uh, that's it's not definitely not uh, part of the idea, the ideology of Xi Jinping of a uh, Xi Jinping thought. It's um, a socialism with Chinese characteristic thing, right? It's it's not in that vein. It's it's uh, I mean, yeah, it's definitely about accru- it's accruing power for the state, but it's kind of harnessing uh, private power for themselves. So it's kind of like they still respect them, but they want to harness them. Um, and if you don't go along with this plan, well, they'll, they'll find other means to get you. So, um, she was much more forceful. Um, well, yeah, I mean, he was forceful in general, you know, com- compared to everyone else in, in, in getting private industry to, to basically, I, I would call it nationalize. I, I, I'm just going to start using that word. I think that's an easier word to use, although it's not official. Uh, they're not officially state run companies. I think most people understand, you know, um, uh, for instance, like when Tencent or, you know, what is, what's the one that uh, Huawei, for instance, when they install their 5G in another country, most people rightfully see it as a national security threat because it's not just a private company. This isn't just some, this is a, uh, isn't like, uh, I'm not, I was thinking, I was going to think of some big American company and I realized I didn't trust them either. It's not like Apple. They're the good guys. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, okay, McDonald's, right? It's not like McDonald's is, is doing, right? It's a private company but really it's uh, behind the scenes if the chinese government says you need to do this you need to put this chip into the huawei chips um you need but maybe it's spyware just saying maybe it's spyware you have to do it right everyone gets that by now um but this it, this this wasn't always i mean sorry it was always the case like the the um the state has always uh always you know <laughs> since it's found since it's founding always try to 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 bring the uh uh, the state into relevancy, um, you know, by actually uh, 
being part of the production process and, and that's how it keeps itself relevant the plant part of the planned economy right um but you know it's kind of doing it in a little bit of a different direction so it's kind of like doing the same things as before um you know wanting to have like a strong central state with a kind of planned economy but like with again different characteristics and i've referred to this also as fascism um, just by the original mussolini definition of a, a marriage between um the the private industry and state and that's that's what it was but before before it was kind of like a a, a very mutual kind of thing um they both parties had power but now it's come to the point where the, the state is really trying to just now turn it into a horse uh trying to turn it into a workhorse for itself where it can kind of just whip it and make it do exactly what it likes right so how did we get from guo wengui Gui into this because it's from this environment where you've got say guo wengui he's built up his pangu plaza he's a billionaire you know he's he's worked his way up um yes he i do believe he's he had to know a lot of people maybe he had to grease some palms but i also think he had to work hard i don't think you don't i don't you don't just get ahead just by greasing her palms you know i think he actually you know he he built hotels he built a lot of things in china right i mean that's a contribution to the country right but at the end of the day um i only i'm only saying what i what i'm saying what i'm about to say now based on the fact i listened to some of his pre, um his secret phone calls um with certain communist party officials i listened to this a while back and um for those who want to accuse me of like maybe I misheard something and my Chinese sucks, uh, it, was, it had English subtitles, so I, I certainly haven't made any mistakes there. Uh, but basically, it's it's like an hour long um, dialogue, and basically, it's he's talking to um, a, a communist part, um, like I, I, it was like uh, yeah, I f someone in the police or something. I, I, can't, I can't remember who it was, but it was, it was someone very powerful. It was basically trying to convince you know, Gao Wenguai to like kind of sell his his uh, like shares in his company or something, or it was like he was. Okay, I, I it's, it was a while since I watched it, right? So I'm gonna have to paraphrase. Generally, he wanted him to basically sell his company or uh, get more, allow certain people into his organization that would basically render him obsolete within his own organization. And well, uh, he would basically would be give it, giving over the keys to the kingdom. Um, and you know, he was Wong well, Gray is kind of like playing along. Oh yeah, it's great. I don't know. Yeah, brother, I don't know. I don't know. I'll think about it. You no. Know. Um, so that that's kind of like the the context you know you I, i'm not saying it happens in one call I, I i i'm not saying that you know that just that one call proves everything because actually it's that's not actually how they do it. they just call you don't become a billionaire one day they call you up hey like you know you've got a you know you you've got a lot uh, i go you know you'd be you'd be a patriot it's not like that i mean they do it over time and they already know each other you know they become ingratiated with each other and they cut deals and they try to be more diplomatic about it. if you keep your your feet firmly planted they come after you a bit higher and it might happen over years you know they muscle in on your territory you know like like mafia style but again they 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 don't it's not just like just they just kick the front door down it's not like that sorry they uh, i don't know if you heard that so they don't just kick the front door down um but yeah so i was kind of watching towards a little bit of the end of the saga you know so that this recording was like in 2015 just the year before he left um and they started like yeah pressuring his family members or something like that and um um yeah he ultimately decided to leave america because he decided that you know he's he's going to lose everything they're going to they're going to take everything from him he knows how these people work he's seen them do it to other people and he understands if he continues to stay in china they'll take every cent from him right and you might be like again well he's again all that money was corrupt as i mentioned i i talked about this just now i don't believe all that money is, is is corrupt it's not just you know they stole money from the chinese citizens and they left i mean the the people who have done they've been executed like um it's in china you know um i don't believe that's i really don't believe that's the case you know he's got a real company to his name you can see his stuff is he's, he's not yeah, anyway the point is he understood that they were going to take everything and if he wanted to keep that um and he that would come after him and if not him they would start going after his family which is um what the chinese communist party are very fond of doing um so he decided to pack up and leave and um obviously he's trying to take his money with him that's um that's standard right and it's not easy to get your money out of china in general um and it's certainly not even easy to money around if you're a billionaire from china uh and also you're kind of being persecuted by the communist party and you're taking that country that money to a country that's already very suspicious of the country you're coming from it's very messy right so typically the way you do it is you're just going to have to have a lot of friends 
a lot of family in different places with a lot of different bank accounts in different places in the world and you gotta just do some magic and try and get it all in one location at the end. Well, I mean, maybe multiple locations at the end of the day. But the point is, getting your money out is extremely difficult. So I use Bitcoin, plug for wildwest.trade, more about that later. But it's not easy um, to get your money out of China if you're not using Bitcoin. If you're using Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, super easy. But if you're going gray, a lot of money, it's, it's hard, right? And that's why I feel like this is kind of tied into, um, you know, the whole grift thing, the charges of wire fraud and stuff like that, right? Because if you're... Uh, if the, people want to persecute you and you have that, those kinds of financial transactions, it's just cinch. You could do it to anybody. You could do it to me. You could easily get anyone on wire charge for if they m moved enough money around, especially if it's from China, especially if it's from China, right? Um, but he, the, the journey doesn't end with, with Guo Wenguei. What happened was that he was able to go to America, in my, uh, in my opinion, because he had valuable intel about the inner workings of the Communist Party and a lot of very uh, very scandalous information and also just knowing where the gold is buried. Like, Go Wenge can tell exactly, like, this communist, this high-up Communist Party uh, official, he's, he has his money, he's in Bahamas, here's a picture of his house, da 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 and he can do that. And um, I'm sure they've been working a lot with each other um, uh, on that, you know, and just spilling the beans. And he's also, you know, been creating, like, he's been making these YouTube videos and stuff like that where you... He talks about some of the some of his dirt that he has in the Chinese Communist Party, and um, and yeah, and then he's built up this NFSC thing. So I I, I, I tie this into the beginning. My memory is uh, shot, so I actually can't remember if I did I did I talk about like his connection with with the CIA and stuff. If I haven't, just to just to reiterate, again, you cannot survive in America um, if you fl if you fled the Chinese Communist Party and they're baying for your blood, especially because you, you've hurt them. You, you really, really hurt them. He's actually done a lot of things telling them, um, telling the world, uh, and of course, America, exactly where the gold is buried, exactly what the dirt is, exactly how the Chinese Communist Party operates. Um, they obviously want to kill him. And for the most part, it's actually easy to do, um, even if you're a billionaire. So you need to be protected from up high, really up high. Um, in this case, the, <laughs> the intelligence agencies, I guess. Um, in order to be able to, um, in order to be able to survive, so he's. I think he's married at the hip with him, but I think there's been a divorce, and I think um, because there's been a changing of the guard in the White House, um, those people who originally brought him on are no longer there. I'm talking about, you know, um, OMB and Steve Bannon, Orange Man Bad and Steve Bannon. They they brought him in, and um, and uh, they're gone now, and those people are now a uh, cold product. I mean, they they be, they they were considered that way from the beginning, but. Uh, I mean, by by the people persecuting them, and those those persecutions haven't stopped. So, regardless of what you think about Steve Bannon or, or, or Orange Man Bad, um, I'm just going to let you make this, the decision on that. But the question is, do you, do you really believe, after everything I said, that you know, Guo Wenguei's persecution um, is is a really just thing, right? Because on the one hand, you've got he's 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 everyone that has even been in the same room as Trump is being indicted for something. You know, it's like you, like, they would indict a ham sandwich at this point. It, like, they, like, if Trump touched a ham, ham sandwich and th someone found out about it, that ham sandwich would be in jail right now, right? For, for some stupid thing, for being a ham sandwich, right? Um, so anyone that's just even, just breathe the same air as Trump is now being persecuted, right? So... That's the other thing about, like, when I start seeing Guo Wenguei suddenly, like, in the news media, especially when people don't really know him, and the only thing that's really said is, like, oh, Bannon-connected Trump person, sorry, Bannon-connected Orange Man Bad-related Chinese billionaire is, um, is being, uh, sorry, he's, he's being indicted on wire fraud, and he's a bad person. Like, all the, the news article spin is, is obviously not very neutral. Um, and that really kind of makes me wonder, like, how, how legitimate is this persecution? That's number one. That's on the... That's on the on the Western side, right? And on the Chinese side is the fact that they they really have been baying for his blood. Um, they have Chinese police stations uh, throughout America, um, and they're really meant for you know Chinese dissidents. And it's not that they necessarily just come knocking out and drag you out the door. I mean, maybe they, they do do that. I don't know, but they do use lawfare, and um, they use all kinds of different methods to to get you. It's it's not just a simple matter of like 
you know, it's not like the, the, the old days where it's like, you know, AK-47s at your door, come with us right now. It's nothing like that, you know. There's all kinds of things that they do. And with enough money, it's very easy to use lawfare. You don't have to be uh, part of the, the Western League. Whoever has enough money can do it. And I'm, but I'm not talking like, you know, you, you're, you're a billionaire. I'm talking about you have to be part of some very, 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 very big organization that's very, 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 very rich and powerful. You have to be like part of the WF. You have to be a part of the CCP. You can easily buy district attorneys in any state. I just, is that, is that weird to say in 2023 that there's, there's corruption in the United States? Like, I, if this is news to you, well, okay, it's not news anymore. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the news. This is, it's a very corrupt country. So when you've got such a corrupt country, and uh, it's particularly in a state that is particularly corrupt. I mean, let's look at United, let's look at New York for a moment. It is filthy. It is, okay, not all of it. Okay, not all of it, right? But from what I understand, it, it's very dangerous compared to what it used to be before. Like, is, is that a, is it a stretch, okay? I, mean, I don't have to rely on hyperbole. It's much, much, much more dangerous than it was before. Um, and the uh, what's within the power of the district attorney could be, uh, you know, trying to help fix a lot of these, these issues, you know, not releasing people who have committed murders back out into the streets 24 hours after they've been arrested. Um, stuff like that would actually, it would seem like it would help New York a lot. You know, but instead, they're indicting ham sandwiches, they're indicting uh, Orange Man Bad for s- having sex with a hooker 20 years ago that he paid hush money for. Like, I don't care about that. Like, wh- wh- why? Wh- how you c- like, arresting a former president, um, it's never happened in 240 years. You better have a damn good reason for it. Um, well, they don't. So if they're willing to do that, I, I, it, it kind of undermines the whole judicial process for me in general. And it kind of makes me wonder, is this legit? And again, whenever I read the reports about... Because um, I, I read the charges um, that were leveled against him. And a lo- all of them... To, I mean, for me, what it comes down to is this. The amount that he, he's being accused of defrauding is a billion dollars. His net worth was a billion dollars. He made a billion dollars in China and he took it to America. How do you do that? He used bank transfers, right? So what are all these accusations, things about... Oh, and by the way, it's not that he did anything. It's that he committed conspiracy to do it. So it's not even that... He did what he said. It's just that he, he thought about it. It's not even... Uh, uh, I, so I don't know. Like, there's all ways you can spin the financial transactions of a couple of hundred grand, a couple of hundred... Uh, sorry, not a couple of hundred, maybe a couple of million to this bank account and, you know, sending it to this bank account and, and whatever. Like, you can spin up all kinds of stories based on those financial transactions. Say, look, it was a conspiracy to do X. It was a conspiracy to do Y. And obviously, they don't have or even, could even read the financial transactions that actually allowed him to make this kind of money. You know, obviously, I mean, is he, you know, he, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. They, they, I'm just saying it's, it's opaque. And within that opaqueness, it's very easy to, to spin up stories that don't exist, you know. And I'm, I'm just more aware of this stuff because it's like, um, you know, because I'm always in the crypto stuff. It's like I use crypto stuff to avoid these kinds of entanglements, right? And um, it's... Um, when I was in China, right, the way I'd get money, because I was so aware about all the, the, the crap that would go on when you're sending money abroad, um, that uh, I, I just, I didn't want to use bank transfers at all, right? Like, it could be that, like, my boss decided just not to pay tax. If I decided I want to go send that money back home to Australia, um, if, he, if my boss didn't pay tax, I could, I could get in trouble for that, you know? Um, so stuff like that would happen. So what I would do is I'd use WeChat Pay and Alipay to buy Bitcoin on peer-to-peer exchanges like WildWest.Trade. And then I would use that Bitcoin. Um, I mean, I would just keep it. It's like I didn't even have to send it away. I don't have to send it anywhere. It exists nowhere and everywhere at the same time. And then later when I need that money on back in Australia, boom, it was just in my bank account. No problem. If I didn't want to worry about the volatility of Bitcoin, I just transfer it straight into my bank account in Australia. It was, it was no problem. It was really easy. And I don't have to worry about any of this crap that could happen, right? Because uh, I'd be like miles gone. So yeah, that's a plug for Wild West Store Trade. Make sure to sign up now, a quick plug, and also Wild West Exchange. You can actually use Bitcoin to buy and sell stuff. And also sign up with the link below for ExpressVPN, just in case you're in China or any crap hole country that bans stuff that doesn't want you to let you see stuff. You can sign up with my link and uh, you can get a discount on that. So that's that's a plug for now. So Miles uh, Quok, because he didn't use um, Bitcoin to get his money out, he's involved in all these things. Um, but yeah, it's it's rather silly if you ask me. And as far as I can tell, given everything I said about what he's doing for um, against the Communist Party, because they're pretty big things. I mean, citing his NFSC, 
citing his own country in absentia. Of course they hate him. He has millions of viewers who look at him with googly eyes. They love this guy. He's really seen as like um, a savior in something. He has something, um, there is something, he's a, he's a special star quality about him. He even sings and stuff like that, you know. Um, as far as Chinese people are con concerned, he's, he's, a, he's, a very, he's very different. You know, I call him flamboyant, perhaps that's not the right word, word to use. He's larger than life. He's larger than life. Is he a great world leader that, you know, will bring China, uh, you know, out of the communist stages into, into some kind of new utopia? Let me be, let me be frank. Let me, let me be nuanced about this, right? I think that the persecution against Miles, Miles Gore is just despicable. I think it's, I, I, I think it is, in fact, um, he is, in fact, being persecuted from both sides. You know, he was thrown under the bus by his own allies in, in the West, and um, he, he's being persecuted by the Communist Party because, you know, he's in a fight with them. And essentially, for all intents and purposes, he's being persecuted for fighting the Communist Party. That's really what it comes down to at that stage, right? That's, if you don't agree with me, I, I would like to hear your opinion. Now, a lot of people will um, understand what I've said to be true, but they might not disagree with it because they might like the Communist Party, they might be nationalists. Um, and I would, yeah, I mean, let, let me... Um, let, let me let me also say this as well, right? So considering all that I said, my actual, my support, that I have real support for Gore and Gray, but let me also say this as well. I understand, on the other hand, he's, he's I would consider him quite anti-China at the same time. And um, this might come as a shock to people, but like, so he, he actually says, um, you know, I guess if, if the NFSC comes about, the Communist Party collapses and he, you know, he's the government abstention, he, he goes to China, What's going to happen? Well, he's basically run what, what, I, what, I, like, what I like to call glowies. Glow in the dark um, thing, words I shouldn't say here that will get me banned off the stream. So for those who don't know what a glow in the dark person is, basically someone who is a, a CIA asset. You know, they're basically run by the feds, in this case by America. And through... The, he didn't create the NFSC on, on his own. You know, that requires a lot of work. I mean, it just reminds me of like all the stuff the State Department does with their... You know, with their little, like, they create, like, different umbrella things here and color revolutions here. And they have, like, different parties and abstention that they, they will. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll have, like, just some country that they don't like. And they'll say, okay, we're going to create, like, our own party of, of your... And, and we're going to say that this is, like, the government in abstention. And actually, um, the point is, the moment that the head of that country uh, gets decap... The leadership gets deca decapitated in a coup or something like that. Then the CIA flo flies in the new government. And they do that with everything. They do that with everything. They, they do that with, like, um, with, um, the Afghan you know, th uh, president. They, they do that with all countries, right? So to me, that's what really what the NFSC is. Like, on, on that... On like, the, on, like, the CIA level, like, the military level. Like, they support him because he has the ability to do that, or at least has the ability, if not to do that, I think it's, it's very far-fetched, but it's got the ability to at least split um, the, the uh, continue to split the identity of, of China and not uh, have people to continue to consolidate around the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. So he's kind of meant to be a foil to that, particularly the Chinese in the outside free world. And... Um, this is, uh, I think, a very effective strategy, but I also just kind of want to almost think about it just from the perspective of actual real Chinese back home because the interests of the Chinese people that actually live on the mainland are completely different to the Chinese that live overseas. So if you live in the Chinese overseas, for the most part, a lot of them um, have very sore memories of the Tiananmen Square because I, I think about anyone over the age of 50 has 40, yeah, 40, 50 years old, is kind of like of that age range where they experience that. And if they live abroad, the chance of them being educated and kind of being of that generation is very likely. And if they left, you know, during that time, they have a lot of these kind of older, very, I want to say older, like more, more freedom orientated opinions about the direction of China. And many of them fled during that time um, to the West. And um, yeah, so there's a real, uh, you know, hankering for freedom, I guess you could say, amongst the foreign Chinese and also amongst the foreign Chinese in the world. Uh, generally, they're from the provinces that are kind of, you know, they're a little different culturally, right? And they, they, um, may, they also are more likely to have uh, Western values. But the ones in, in, in the mainland are, are quite different. And from their perspective, I, I think from the ones that live there, some of the things are going away. And if he was ever, if NFSC ever did come to power in China, like, I just want to say, like, what some of the things he said he would do. One of them is... Um, he would basically partition China 
like like the good old uh, century of humiliation days and he would basically say okay Xinjiang you can be your own country uh, Tibet you can be your own country Inner Mongolia you can be your own country and most importantly Guangdong you can be your own country so China is really gonna look very different right so a lot of people say well look um, Xinjiang, Tibet, you know, let them do their own thing, cut them loose, let them be their own country because they're a different ethnic group and they've been persecuted a long time. In Mongolia, maybe it's the same thing, you know, we can do that as well. But I think most people, could, well, a lot of people would be like Guangdong. That's been part of China for like more than 2,000 years, like longer. Uh, Guangdong is as much as China as like America and apple pie. Like you're splitting that up. I understand there's cultural and like language differences and they don't always get along and stuff like that um but that's a bridge too far i mean not enough for me i'm not chinese i don't have a dog in this fight but i mean just on a historical and cultural level that's pretty extreme and it kind of just makes me first you could say well look you know maybe um guang Wei just isn't very well read uh maybe he doesn't really understand history as well and he doesn't understand he's been away from the country for too long you know he hasn't touched grass but that's one way of looking at it. But on the other hand, it kind of just also makes me think of like, is this ultimately going to just be like a Trojan horse that kind of carves up China? If somehow, like, again, it's so far-fetched, I do not believe the Chinese Communist Party is going to be decapitated. Like, you know, the leadership's going to be decapitated. It's not going to work like that. They're not going to be taken over. It's not going to... But, you know, it's, it's an thought experiment, or at least in terms of what he's promoting. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say I, I agree, or at least believe that many people in mainland China would would have a, a very good idea, uh, would think it would be a very good thing for China to be carved up like that because that's really putting China, China in a big, big, very bad situation if it does that. I'm not saying that it might not be good for other people. I'm just saying that if, if you were just looking at your own personal self-interest, like, would you want China to do that? Like, it's, it's, it's almost like in America, it's like, would you just want, like, Alaska and Hawaii to just be like, yeah, we're, we're just going to claim independence. You know, let's just do Texas. I know a lot of people, like, oh, would they like separations, but... It's different. Okay, maybe it was a bad example because they, a lot of people might be like, no, like let the Guangdongs, let the people from Guangdong have like a, a, a Texit or a Cal Exit. You know, it's not like it's not like in America where you just people like different states to seed and stuff like that. Like China's been like mostly a whole thing for like a long time, and I understand like places like Xinjiang and Tibet would make little cameos throughout history, but they're not always part of the thing. But Guangdong it, and, and Inner Mongolia was was not like a, a conquered territory either. You know, it's the Mongols that conquered. China, and then brought the Inner Mongolia, Inner Mongolia ter territory into China itself, right? So it's it's the other way around. Uh, I understand the you know, uh, Inner Mongolia, you know, Inner Mongolia. They're actually you know scrubbing out the language uh, a little bit. You know, I mean, no, maybe this maybe you know more about it than I do, but uh, they are they are doing things that are, do are persecuting, um, particularly different language groups. Um, and that's, that is a big deal, but again like total independence like you know let bring inner mongolia back to mongolia i mean when when the, when the Qing and um collapsed you know there was there was war with uh well, you know it almost became a much bigger war with mongolia just about like the situation who's going to get it now war and great just going to give it to them free i personally feel like if someone who came up with this plan it was came up with someone who's just very historically illiterate um or someone who is um intentionally trying to uh destroy china and again, I'm saying this some without a dog in the fight. It's just uh, that, that's ultimately what I think would happen if Gorenge actually did the things he would say he would do. It, it would not be good. He also mentioned about he in his in when it comes to politics and, and government. He he said he wanted for, lots of foreigners and and dual dual. He specifically specifically said dual citizens to come into office to give like their you know their fresh foreign ideas. I mean, this struck struck me as very odd. Um, and it is considering the last video I made about the Mansfield uh, fund and uh, the the Taiwan fellowship agreement. This is literally what they did in Japan. Uh, sorry, what America, the State Department specifically did in Japan, and Thai, and what they're doing in Taiwan. And I um, mean, they're just uh, filling the country with with their own apparatchiks. The State Department specifically, and they're using them really to to further American interests for themselves at the expense of the country. I talked about yesterday. How about? You know, these kinds of people have, have helped, you know, coerce and, uh, Japan into bending the knee for American economic interests at the expense of their own and how they're doing these kinds of things in Taiwan as well um, to steer direct the policy direction what I, in what I can only assume would be a more pro-American and anti-China direction. So that to me is a real concern. It, it seems that Guo Wengui, 
I, I, I'm not saying he just reads, he's reading off a script and the CIA is giving to him. I'm just saying that he's an asset of them. Um, that's how he, he's alive. And um, a lot of the things that he would do if he was to, to actually bring this NFC thing to China would, in my opinion, be very destructive to China. So that's my caveat about Guo Wenwei. Like, I like him. I disagree with him. At the end of the day, what it really comes down to is I don't like people who are being persecuted unjustly. Like, if he did actually do those things, then he deserves to go to jail. But it doesn't seem to be that he actually really did anything. And it seems that this is another media witch hunt. And I'm actually shocked that it's come to a stage where I speculate. I only speculate, but it does feel like there's a lot of um, very, very, um, well, cooperation between um, China's biggest enemy, which is, sorry, America's biggest enemy, which is the Chinese Communist Party, and the people that are persecuting Guo Wenwei, which are the same people really persecuting Bannon and Trump, and the, the very molecules that were breathed out by Trump. You know, there were also those things are being persecuted, also those, those things in jail. Like, just a germ that came out of his mouth, it's, it's now probably in jail right now. You know, that's basically the state of, uh, of America right now. And again, you, the thing is as well about uh, what, I, what I said about uh, Guo Wenwei is the same for any of these political figures. Or it doesn't matter if it's Trump, like Bannon, it doesn't matter whether you like or disagree with me. If you really... It, it, it's just that the, these things are just, uh, they're, they're getting out of control. I just, I can't stand it. You know, just, there's always in the news media cycle, Orange Man Bad did another thing. Oh, this person that talked to him last year is now in trouble for this. And now this thing, and now this thing, and now this thing. And it's just like, really? He did all those things? And also, um, and it's just like, I don't, I don't know. I really don't, maybe I need a survey. Like how many people still actually believe in this, this orange man bad nonsense, right? The, the Russia thing, for instance, it's, it's now clear that he didn't really do anything with, with Russia. Um, yet they're still going after him for it, despite the fact that it's, it's, it's over. Like it's done. It's still, it's over, right? And they're still, they just won't stop. They just keep banging on about it. And so I feel like they've lost their credibility. It should have been clear a long time ago. Oh, sorry, when I say they, I want to say these prosecutors, right? Um, they're always coming up with something new to attack someone for something they didn't do. So ultimately what it is, is that you've, you've got the, these, prosecu these prosecutors. I don't have, think they have any credibility anymore. And I think these, these are all very politically motivated. So ultimately, I think to surmise this video is that I think Guo Wenwei is, at least for the things that he's being accused of, it's probably innocent. And if I'm wrong about it, I'm... I'm totally okay with admitting that I'm wrong about it, and we're, we're just going to let time um, play out. But so far, that's just the way I'm seeing it, because it's just, I think most people don't understand that when you um, stick your head up, you know, from, from the poppy fields, um, you will get cut. So in Australia, we say the tallest poppy gets cut, essentially, right? And um, every country has, has a mix of this. Um, you know, in Australia, there is a bit of a tall poppy syndrome. I didn't really experience it as much, but it's, it's, I think everyone can kind of attest to this existence. Um, you know, other countries say crabs in a bucket. And I think a lot of people just, when I, when I read the comments, especially like the Chinese comments and a lot of these videos, um, were like, yeah, let's get him. Screw, screw Wong Wei. I hate him. It's so glad they got him in trouble. Ha ha ha. Like, um, those are like the Umao comments. And it's just kind of like a lot, a lot of what they'll say after would be like, wow, look how rich he is. It's so glad we got him. Of course, like, there's kind of like a, a, just a deep envy um, for someone else's success that I, I, I noticed. So a lot of these people would be like, uh, like because he, uh, this guy was very ostentatious with his wealth. It's, it's up to you whether you agree with whether someone should be ostentatious or not. But the, the fact is a lot of people would just be, just look at his, his wealth and say, oh, it, if he's rich, it must be because he got it all from graft. You know, they, they couldn't have envisioned that someone could actually work hard for their money and and actually, and actually do it. And I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll find out later, but I just can't help feel like a lot of this, the, the witch hunts that you, you'll find, it's just the, the minute, what do they call it in 1984? The minute of rage, uh, right? So there'll be some like uh, persecuted figure in the 1984 universe and everyone would, who has like suppressed, um, I would say suppressed dopamine, you know, because they're not moving up in life. Their life has no meaning. Their life is completely garbage. But for like a minute, they get to feel like they have power um, and they can do it in like a safe environment. So they can, they can get out all their angers and frustration about how crap the world is and how crap their lives is. For a brief moment, 
um, by kind of being like, yeah, get that person. Yeah, I'm better than him. Yeah, he's rich now. Look at him. Yeah, let's get him, right? And they, they'll, in order to feed that, a lot of people are willing to lie to themselves or accept lies just to be able to have that. Uh, and I, I didn't really mean for it to get on this kind of tangent, but it's just to me, this has been like a very big red pill over the past two, three years. Where I realized that the, the, the ethic and way of life that the cult- of the cultural revolution is in China, it's like that exists universally for everyone and everyone thinks that no i could never have been like those crazy students during the 60s and 70s in china what do you see around you like just turn on the tv look how people are acting they're exacting exactly like how they were in the 1960s and 70s in china completely out of their mind um so this is ultimately what i think it's it's just come down to it's um there is a lot of opaqueness as i've discussed i mean this video is going to run a long time just talking about this one this one little character i had to talk about all this history there's so much nuance in it and despite all this incredible nuance even here i'm saying like as someone who's studied this a long time like you know what like i think i know a lot but I'm, I'm i'm still just waiting and seeing versus say the average person who doesn't know anything they get all their information from the news media they have no aptitude in this stuff but for a brief moment they get to go get him let's get him yeah kill Jesus, let's release Barabbas, you know, there's a lot of that, that kind of vibe going, I remember reading that, like, I mean, I, re- I read that, obviously, the Gospels, like, a gajillion times, but, you know, there's some parts where you can't really relate to, and it's like, why, why would they just, why would, the, why would they release Barabbas over Jesus, it doesn't make sense, Jesus didn't do anything, Barabbas is literally a murderer, um, but maybe it made more sense with the context of that time, like, if you just read that, you're like, that's almost comical that that would even happen, it doesn't make sense, but maybe if we were there at the time, I mean, it's, it's kind of, maybe it's believable for various reasons. It's just maybe there's certain things that we can't really relate to now. But we can see it within our own individual context that people still have that kind of desire to just just gnash their teeth, um, you know, just for the opportunity to, um, to I guess, spite something that, that, they, uh, that they, they think um, is, is better than them or, is, or something like that. Because, uh, again, as far as I can tell... Um, I do think Gore and Gwei is a hero, even if I disagree with him, even if I disagree with a lot of things. I just think he's a, I really do think he's a Hao Han. I think he's a Hao Han, honestly. Um, he's, um, in Chinese, it means um, good guy. But a, a good guy in the, in the Hao Han se- definition is it's, it's more complex. There's good things about him, there's bad things about him. Uh, but I don't hate him, and I just, I'm just kind of sickened by the, um, just the, the witch hunts, you know, uh, that just, that can exist out of nowhere. I mean, no one, very few people knew who he was, and just suddenly he's in the news, and all the news is suddenly bad. Um, that, that is not natural. That is not an organic thing, right? So first they, they push it out there because they want people to feel the same way, and then when it reaches the masses, then the masses do the whole minute of rage thing, and they'll forget about it two seconds later and haven't learned anything. But um, I hope by watching this video, you were able to learn something. I think I said everything that I want to say, um, but just bear with me for one minute. I'm just going to just check in to see if there's anything else I need to tell you about. Um, this particular thing. Um, okay, that's pretty much it. It's probably too long anyway. But uh, yeah, just one final plug uh, for the sponsor of this video. WildWest.Trade, WildWest.Exchange, and um, sign up for my ExpressVPN link. Um, you can go into WildWest.Exchange, actually use your Bitcoin to buy real things. You know, we've been waiting for adoption for all this time. And people are like, well, I, I don't want to buy Bitcoin because I can't do anything with it. My friend, you've, you've missed the boat. For a long time, you were able to buy things in Bitcoin. Um, I would say maybe the biggest things that were holding it back were just uh, transaction f- transaction fees, you know. But we've got Lightning Network. We've got a lot of different um, different tools we can get around it. You know, you could use stable coins and use different chains like uh, Binance Smart Chain and all these different things. So basically, there's a bit of a learning curve to it. But when you when you get into that learning curve, you can find that you can just get lost in this world. You can use your Bitcoin to do business. You could do your Bit- use your Bitcoin to obviously do all the various financial transactions you would otherwise you know you can use it for DeFi, and there's all kinds of things you could do in DeFi. um but all your ultimately you can just use it to buy and sell things and that's what it's supposed to be for so wild western exchange you can use that buy real life things buy food you can buy food there now that's incredible i have not really found anywhere where you can buy food with bitcoin i think it's going to be hugely valuable in the future and um yeah, so uh, that's all she wrote. I'll see you next time, guys. Make sure to subscribe and check me out as well on um, other, some of the other platforms because um, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm less and less friendly terms with YouTube as I speak more. So um, make sure to sign up on, um, uh, sorry, subscribe on BitChute, Rumble, and Odyssey. So see you later.